I'm Michael Kaplan. I'm presenting an anti-email spam and anti-web spam system. This is automatic authentication of email servers and personal computers independent of the active participation of server administrators or personal computer users. So this is overview of current authentication. Every aspect of an email can be falsified except for the IP address of the final mail transfer agent or server to pass along the email. This final IP address must be revealed as transferring an email between servers is a multi-step conversation. Uh, however, even the identity of this final mail transfer agent can be obscured if a dynamic IP address is used. The, mo the most commonly used domain authentication scheme is SPF or sender ID, a similar system, and in that domain administrators manually maintain a list of the domain's authorized MTAs in the domain name system. And this is good because it's simple to implement, but it's also kind of bad in ways because forwarding will break authentication since only the final MTA is authenticated. But I'd say that the biggest problem is that a large number of domains, maybe half, uh, do not deploy SPF despite the ease of this implementation. A more sophisticated authentication scheme, DK, DKIM, <clears throat> and the related domain keys will authenticate an email's domain and the message content via digital signatures. And for this, domain administrators have to manually distribute the private keys to the domain MTAs and configure their MTAs. And the respective public keys are then manually listed in the domain's DNS record. And this is good because its forwarding does not break authentication. However, it's also pretty bad because there is very low deployment. Only 7.4% of Fortune 500 companies deploy it for their top level domains. I'm just going to do a quick review of digital signatures since understanding how these work is critical to understanding how my proposal works. So the first component of digital signatures to understand are hashes. And, uh, and hashes are algorithms that will grind up data to produce a unique fin fingerprint. So here we have an email message, happy birthday grandma and we send it through our hash algorithm that looks kind of like a meat grinder and it will spit out our hash. Now the second thing we need to understand to understand digital signatures, we need to understand public key encryption. And with public key encryption, we take uh, a bit of data, our, like our message, happy birthday grandma, and we send it across a one-way key that will encrypt it. And if we wanted to decrypt it using this same key, well, you can't. You have to, uh, we are unable to decrypt what it, what was previously encrypted with a single key. So we need to go to the corresponding key, a one-way key that goes in the other direction, and that will decrypt the message. So uh, each of these keys can encrypt data that only the other one can decrypt. And one of these we call the private key, and the other one we call the public key. The only difference, the private key remains private, the public key is public, and you can just swap these labels around and use the top one as the public key and the bottom one as the private key. So now we're going to merge these two concepts of hash and public key encryption to create a digital signature. So we, over here we have an email with an email body and the email header. And we have our message, happy birthday grandma. And we have our hash algorithm and we're going to actually hash this message. And here we have our message hash and we're going to encrypt it with this one way key, this private key that only we have. And the result is a message hash that has been encrypted with a private key. Well, there's a different name for a message hash that has been encrypted with a private key. And that name is digital signature. So we're going to take this digital signature and we will discreetly hide it in the message header where normal people won't see it. And we will email our email off. All right. Now the email arrives and we want to check the di digital signature. So the receiver now takes out the same hash algorithm and will uh, hash the email message. Uh, and that's the message hash generated by the receiver. The digital signature is pulled out of the header. And now we get, uh, we acquire the one way key, the public key that corresponds to the private key. And if this were DKIM, uh, we would have gotten this from the domain name system. So uh, 
um, now we will decrypt this hash and now uh, we will compare these two hashes and we see that these hashes match so we know that the sender actually sent this message now the first system I'm going to explain is MTA authentication the goals of MTA authentication are to counter spam by authenticating every MTA listed in the header of every email in the world, solve the problem of dynamic IP addresses, and enable SPF to authenticate the domain despite email forwarding. And this system only requires a one-time update by the relatively small number of MTA software vendors in the world. Once existing MTA software receives an update, each MTA will autonomously generate its own public-private key pair. Each private key will remain forever hidden on the server that generated it. So with this update, every MTA will sign every email it touches. So here we have three MTAs that have been upgraded with MTA authentication compliant software. And we see our email comes in and each MTA is going to place its own digital signature in the header of the email. And the result is that the MTAs are authenticated. The email domain itself is not directly authenticated. Okay, so now this email message has arrived at our receiving mail server, but uh, we have this problem. No one has registered MTA's number one's public key with any public database. So how does the receiver get the public key? Well, the answer is simply by asking MTA number one directly. So the receiving mail server reaches across the internet and it says, what is your public key? And MTA number one will respond, my public key is, well, whatever the public key is. So the receiver can now authenticate MTA number one as the originating server without having any domain administrator manually entering the public key into any public database. So, what does this do? Before mail transfer agent authentication, only the final mail transfer agent could be authenticated. You wouldn't know about any of the earlier ones, but now that we have this software update, every single mail transfer agent is authenticated. Okay, so uh, another great feature is that an updated MTA can never be spoofed. Uh, so here we have a situation of an email apparently going from MTA number one to number two until it reaches this receiving mail server and we have this email which says this is your bank please verify your account information well sounds like a bit of a suspicious email but we look at the uh, signatures in the header and well there are no signatures so does that mean we can't check check it using MTA authentication well yes you will check it because uh, the receiving mail server will still ask the purported MTA if it signs emails. So receiving mail server is going to reach across the internet and say to MTA number one, do you sign your email? And MTA number one is going to answer back, yes, I sign every email. Well, MTA number one signs every email, and yet there's no signature in the email, so we know that MTA number one never originated this email, and that this email is spam. So an updated MTA can never again be spoofed. Dynamic IP addresses often frustrate IP address reputation databases because obviously uh, both good and bad zombie computers, so to speak, keep on changing, swapping back and forth their IP addresses. Um, however, once the MTA has been updated with MTA authentication, uh, the public key will never change even if the IP address is constantly changing. So each time a receiving mail server gets an email from one of these I, a dynamic IP address MTAs, it will simply ask, what is your public key? Uh, and when the IP addresses switch again, the receiving mail server is of course just going to ask again, what is your public key? So um, a MTA with a dynamic IP address will be recognized by their public key, not by the IP address, and the problem of dynamic IP addresses is solved. SPF will also be enhanced. Now we know that SPF is unable to authenticate a, do a, do a domain when email is forwarded, 
But with this system, we have now authenticated every MTA listed in the email header. Uh, so really, SPF combined with MTA authentication effortless, effortlessly results in a near DKIM equivalent because you can forward email, still authenticate the domain, and you are also authenticating the message content itself.